just going to start off with um, one question to each of you since uh, this has been such a, a great territory. And what I'm trying to do is just sort of focus in on where the things you've taught us might go intersect with issues or stories we're dealing on, and then we'll let everybody uh, sort of um, uh, move right in. So, um, Matt, you sort of suggested your own first question, which is, we heard yesterday from um, Putin a lot of discussion, not really of the weapons, but of the delivery systems. And his essential argument was, or at least as we cast it this morning, was that he was focusing on delivery systems that could evade all of our missile defenses, the torpedo, hypersonic um, cruise missile, and so forth. And so the question that that raises is, first of all, is he right? Does this avoid all missile defenses? And secondly, what would be the wisdom or the madness in trying to get together defensive systems that could actually be a weak so the reality is that the United States and Russia throughout most of the nuclear age have been, as uh, one person said, uh, like two scorpions in a bottle, each capable of destroying the other, but only at the price of being destroyed in return themselves. And there's no real defense against nuclear weapons that can change that basic reality. Uh, when one weapon can destroy an entire city, and there are thousands of weapons involved, it's the defense problem is the first approximation hopeless. Nonetheless, the United States has been deploying uh, missile defenses, not, we said, uh, to protect against the Russians or the Chinese, but to protect against the tiny number of missiles that might be launched by the North Koreans or the Iranians. Uh, but the Russians have been feeling, as Putin expressed, uh, ah, this is really about us. Uh, and um, it is true that uh, the United States also has <coughs> offensive capabilities to destroy, at least in principle, a large fraction of Russian nuclear weapons uh, before they were launched. Uh, and so Russian strategists have been worrying. And according to President Putin, they've now come up with quite a number of different uh, responses. And I. These responses would be effective. They're mostly, most of them are things the United States thought about, tested, didn't get around to deploying uh, in the past because there wasn't much of a missile defense problem. But the normal ballistic missile flies on a very predictable trajectory. And so uh, yeah, a satellite sees it being launched, radars track it, and you can say, okay, in 10 minutes it's going to be there, so I'll fire my interceptor toward there. And what he's talking about is um, a hypersonic weapon that instead of going up, goes right at the top of the atmosphere and can zig and zag all over the place. We're developing them also, the China's developing them also. Uh, he's also talking about a torpedo that goes through the ocean and so isn't up there in space where the, uh, where the uh, missile defenses could be getting them. Also a cruise missile that would fly through the atmosphere and has according to him, almost unlimited range because it's nuclear powered. Um, none of these change the fundamental picture. The reality is the United States and Russia can each destroy each other. That was true without Russia developing any of these new weapons. It will be true with Russia developing all of these new weapons. The fundamental issues of the strategic balance aren't really changed. What is changing in a way that, that distresses me is the degree of tension between the United States and Russia, which can create uh, opportunities for accident, you know, misperception, et cetera. And then the degree of reliance on use of small tactical nuclear weapons early in a conflict, uh, both on the Russian side and increasingly on the US side, uh, there is that emphasis, and I, I worry that you can you can lay out a wide variety of pretty plausible scenarios where you know uh, minor conflict gets going, things happen that one side interprets as more of an escalation than the other side intended it to be. There's cyber going back and forth on both sides, confusing everybody, um, and pretty soon somebody uses a nuclear weapon, and all sorts of things get completely out of control. When you're in a crisis. It's like being in a war. Stuff happens that the leaders didn't 
intend or anticipate. The during the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, turns out that the Navy's standard operating procedure for implementing a blockade is to drop depth charges on enemy submarines to force them to the surface. So the Navy, unbeknownst to either Kennedy or McNamara, was dropping depth charges on nuclear-armed Soviet submarines. And on one of those submarines, they had a vote as to whether they should fire, and only one guy vetoed. So we wouldn't be sitting here having that, this conversation if he hadn't vetoed. Well, um, Kate, let me take you to say for to the Iran nuclear agreement, which we talked about some um, last night. So, in the processes that you showed, the key of the agreement when the U.S. was negotiating was that we had to have the assurance that it would take Iran at least one year in order to be able to go produce enough fuel to make a single nuclear weapon, and when the administration realized that John Kerry did not exactly have the qualifications of, uh, uh, to make that testimony, they brought in Ernie Moniz, who did, and that's what he ended up sort of working through with Saleh, the, uh, uh, the, his Iranian um, counterpart. So as you look at the agreement as it's signed now and what you know about the process you showed us, what are the risks over the next few years of something happening that would take us below that one year threshold. So you're referring to maybe a, a technical advancement or just a... It, a it could be a technical advancement. It could be the Iranians reacting to something the U.S. has done. It could be the U.S. abandoning part of the agreement. So I'm, I think it's well established that, uh, you know, should the agreement fall by the wayside for any reason. Uh, you know, the infrastructure is there to definitely make HEU again. Um, and I think the reprocessing is another, that's a different uh, question. So it was actually a really big part of the deal that I think people didn't really appreciate was the fact that, you know, in this deal it says, you know, they're not gonna reprocess, they're not going to do it for 15 years. It's it's one of the sunset provisions, but um, so that means they would have to then, you know, build that infrastructure, start doing it. Um, so I think that honestly, the the main risk would be, from my end, just signaling that, you know, uh, from either the U.S. or from Iran that uh, we're not going to keep doing this deal, and yeah, they could definitely start making HU again. I, I'm. Let's say they started with the infrastructure they have today. What, what do you, how long do you think it would take them to build back up to where they were just when we signed the deal in, in July 2015? I mean, I believe them when they say, you know, a few weeks, um, or sometimes I've heard a week. I, I would believe that. I think to that start, but not to, to get start. to the start. But, but that, not to build the whole. Not the question was to actually get to a point where you could build a weapons or the material. So I don't think it would. Yeah, no, I don't think it would uh, happen less than a year, that's my opinion. But certainly the infrastructure could be restarted in a much shorter time. One thing I would say is that they won't build it back the way it was. They'll build it back with more advanced centrifuges, uh, easier to hide, more efficient. Um, Which they can start building so at your It'll be even worse than us. Right. Uh, yeah. um, Alex, on command and control, so um, the president has got the exclusive authority over only two weapons that I'm aware of, nuclear and cyber. Those are the two things where only the president can, can issue uh, an order. Um, is there a similar structure in the cyber world or what you showed us in the nuclear world? And secondly, as you look at the legislation that has been proposed in Congress to go slow the president down and require others to sign on, under what conditions would that apply? Because clearly there would not be time for a committee meeting if you're under attack. It would only be if you decided to go to something unilateral. Uh, on the first question, I have no idea. Uh, so that's easy. Uh, I, I don't really know that much about the cyber uh, infrastructure uh, plans. Uh, on the legislation, uh, the, the Lou Markey legislation, which is the current one being discussed, is uh, is not about retaliatory strike. It's about first strike. So it basically says, 
if missiles are incoming, then this legislation doesn't apply. Uh, is that adequate? Um, I, I suspect that that would not be considered adequate by STRATCOM or the generals or people who game theory this kind of stuff out. Um, I don't want to like say I don't like the legislation, but I feel like you could word that in ways that would make things uh, a little easier. Uh, to there, there are situations that the American military would like to have the possibility of a very rapid nuclear use that are not strictly retaliatory. So you could imagine, uh, we've never had a no first use provision, for example. Uh, you could imagine uh, incoming chemical weapons, right? Or you could imagine a situation, the sort of equivalent of the, the ticking time bomb for torture discussion situation where you know that they're about to launch and it's imminent and the only way you can get rid of those mobile launchers is to attack the forest and you can't do that with your conventional and lives are on the line and you have minutes to decide and you can't get Congress. Uh, you, you could imagine that kind of thing is often put forward as a sort of motivating factor for rejecting uh, something that would slow things down. I think you could actually write legislation, though, if, you, if that was a goal, that would satisfy that. You could say the president would have to affirm that they believed 100% and had really good reason, and everybody else who was around them believed that this would be the equivalent of a retaliatory in its, in its, in its strike. But, uh, that's one of the issues with trying to come up with good restrictions on this. Uh, that there is this balance, and the military people are very quick to say, look, before you monkey with the system, uh, really take seriously the possibility that we've set up the system uh, uh, to be somewhat flexible and purpose. All right. Um, questions? Hi, I'm Jacqueline Klein. This is Politico. Um, Alex, you talked a little bit about uh, the, the fact that everyone doesn't set up their systems like the U.S. does with the president. Can you talk a little bit about how other countries do it? So we only have sort of, at least I only have, sort of dim views of how they do it in other countries because it's, you know, it, as much as we complain about sort of the secrecy of the American system, we're actually way more transparent about these things than like China is often or, or Pakistan or things like that, uh, or even Britain. Um, but uh, uh, historically, we've gotten some indications that, for example, in the Soviet Union, at least one point in time, the way it worked was you have the Politburo, which is your sort of top political group. And the way they do it is they all agree, or some number of them agrees, to create a, what they call a, a supreme commander in the military. And then that transfers all authority over to this one military person. So this is a different way of handling both the authority and also the sort of civilian military distinction, which is a little more complicated in the Soviet Union anyway than it is in the States. But like that's just one other system. Is that a better system? Is that a worse system? You could argue about this, right? Um, apparently in India, they vest way more control of the weapons in the civilian side, like the military don't have access to the weapons without, you know, supposed to transferring over of some kind of function. Uh, in Pakistan, it's exactly the opposite. The military has way more control over the use of the weapons than uh, civilians. And I don't put these out there again as like one of these is better, one of these is worse. I just put these out there in the uh, there's a lot of different ways you could imagine setting the system up in there. Uh, some of the systems are, uh, like I think the British system is fairly closely patterned on ours. This is like a, a way in which the Cold War evolved. Uh, some of them are not. I don't really know how it works in China at all at the moment. But you can imagine tweaking these variables. And again, I'm a historian, so this is the only historian thing to say. But like the, the way it is today is not necessarily the best of all possible worlds. And it, it, it isn't like some natural thing that fell out of the sky. It, the reason we have it today, and if I had had like 30 more minutes, uh, I would have gone through the sort of historical developments between the Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy administrations. Because these are like the three administrations where all this kind of got hashed out, these early nuclear and, and you know, Truman went one direction, Eisenhower thought that went too far, so he went the other, Kennedy thought that went too far, so they went the other. So we have this very historically developed system, and my question is always, is this the system that best suits our needs at the moment? That's the question we should be asking, not, you know, should we, you know, that's the question. So, yeah. Are you saying that one thing Putin is, doesn't control the nuclear codes in Russia, it's a Politburo situation? No, I think modern Russia is a little different, and there are conflicting accounts. So there's some that have said that it takes three people to do it in Russia. There are some that said, have instead said that any three of those people could do it in Russia. Like Those are very different statements, right? And I don't know what the answer is. I'm not sure in the open source community we do know the answer to that. Uh, so but apparently it has changed since the end of the Soviet Union. One thing that's important is you, know, you only have to make a decision in 20 minutes if you want to launch before the other guy's missiles get there. And I would argue that that launch on warning approach is dangerous and bad. Uh, because there's always the possibility that it's a mistake. 
And we've had multiple occasions on both Russia and the United States of making mistakes that didn't go you know, very far, but gives you the sort of feeling that Trump doesn't want to really, really rely on that. I mean, there was an episode, for example, where somebody put in a training tape. And so all of the different sensors had exactly what you would expect, because it was what the people who wrote the training scenario expected. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, it's my belief that neither we nor other countries should rely on launching missiles on warning of attack. Uh, and, and I'll just point out one of the other ways of maybe changing this problem, this is like Secretary, uh, former Secretary of Defense William Perry suggested, if you get rid of ICBMs, uh, you lose a lot of that need to launch on warning because your subs are not going to be under attack. You, you can weather, you can ride out as awful as it would be, the first attack, you don't need to respond within 10 seconds. You, you're you not in a use it or lose it situation anymore. Is that a good idea? Is it not? I don't know. But like, that's one other way of modifying these variables. We only have a few more minutes, so we'll do these pretty much as fast as we can. So we can okay, as, as fast as I can. Given that uh, in, in C2, you're relying on electronic and telephonic relays to include satellites, how acute are the cybersecurity vulnerabilities here uh, to outside attack, how hardened are they? How are they architected with those concerns built in or modified given that a lot of these are legacy systems and given the way a lot of cybersecurity vulnerabilities actually work, would we even know if, if, these, uh, if, if such an injection has been taking place? I have no idea, good question though. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, I mean the, the answer is many of these things are probably still classified. We know that some of the legacy systems were quite vulnerable to a lot of things. We also know that some of these really old ones, there's, there's sort of an advantage to them being so legacy that you can't hack them. But uh, I think this is the kind of thing that these, where a lot of the work of the C2 people is in trying to figure that out. So I, I don't worry so much about the hacking, uh, because I know that they are probably really worried about the hacking. Well, what are the deterrence implications of that if you can't necessarily rely on assurance? Well, I can't. I mean, I don't know how they confident they feel about it. Um, I'm sure they're a huge deterrent to police. You can access this because of classified information. Yeah, they don't release that to me, so I don't know. But like, I think that they think about this very seriously because if you can shut down the system in some way or fake it out or whatever, that's a problem. But there's some interesting National Academy of Science reports on this, and Jim Miller's done some really interesting work on this recently. He's been the Undersecretary of Policy. You had a question. Um, yes. So I have a pretty simple question, though maybe you have a much more nuanced re response. What prevents Russia from actually giving a weapon to, say, other rogue nations like Syria? Are are we able to track that? And um, you know, is there any sort of technological um, sensors that are on these missiles that will let us know that these missiles are being moved around in some sort of clandestine way? And also, what are the um, technological challenges that exist now um, to prevent Russia from actually launching a strike? So the first, how do, how do we know if Russia is giving weapons to rogue nations? And number two, um, how far are we in terms of preventing Russia from um, launching something? So we don't have any ability to protect, prevent Russia from launching something. Uh, that's a Russian decision. And as I said, you know, the Russian and the United States live in a world where each of them could destroy the other in a matter of half an hour. Sorry, in a technological way. So if, if they were to launch something, how far behind are we in our technology? I don't even understand the question. I, I, we, we aren't behind. They can launch. We can launch. They can launch something, but what, like, what are the things that we can't do yet in order to prevent um, a launch? You know, I, I was at a talk once where somebody who, I don't know if they worked for the government or something, they said, don't you think we'd be investigating how to hack their C2? Don't you think we'd be spending a lot of money on that? If it's that? And so I, I'm sure we have people who have thought about this, but again, the Russians have thought about this too. So. If they hit the button to launch, it'll probably launch. And I don't think there's a lot you're going to be able to probably rely on. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, you know, the ability to prevent them from launching is not a technological option that's available to us. Um, that's, that's the nuclear world that we live in. You can try to nuclear uh, weapons first. That's your, how's that for an ability? <laughs> <laughs> um, and you had, uh, the, uh, with respect to rogue states, in general, uh, that's not uh, the, 
the idea of major powers giving their nuclear weapons to other countries is not something that uh, the national security establishment worries about very much. North Korea giving their nuclear weapons to other countries, yes. But uh, there is the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, Article 1 is uh, basically a bargain between the United States and the Soviet Union that will, neither of us will give nukes to our allies, so the Article 1 says you're not allowed to transfer nuclear weapons to somebody else. Um, uh, and uh, there's every indication, uh, to my mind, that Russia is, is fully compliant with that basic thing. It has, you know, both Russia and the United States think of nuclear weapons as a core element of their power. They don't want to spread it around to other folks. They want to be the ones. Time for two more last. Yeah, can I just, just a quick follow up? We've talked a lot about state actors today and not about non state actors in the black market. How we're, powerful it is. We're, we're, that's the oh, next session. Okay, great. I'll <laughs> The one thing I might piggyback just to say, uh, the question of how do we know if somebody does it or not. Uh, we don't have sensors on the missiles that like track where the warheads go or the things, but we do have databases of the fissile material. Like we do, when you make fissile material, it's going to be a little bit different in every plant, and we have kept records of that. So you can, in principle, uh, we try to keep records on that, and you can, in principle, if a bomb goes off, uh, it might not be instantaneous, but trace that back to call uh, nuclear forensics to the place it was made. Does that tell you who sold it? I mean, there's a whole Tom Clancy book about like how confusing this can be. But like, you might find out it came from America, and what does that mean? And like, you know, that. But that's part. That's meant to be. That attribution is meant to keep people from wanting to do that because we'd be able to say we hope. Oh, that bomb that Al Qaeda set off. It's actually North Korean plutonium. So we're gonna go after North Korea. It's much more likely that you'd be able to rule out sources than that you'd be really confident it came from this particular place. It, if you got lucky, you might be confident about that. So an example of how that might work is actually, um, you don't even really have to know maybe where the plutonium came from. So there was a project a few years ago where they were actually looking at the copper isotopes that had been you know, fused into trinitite glass. The trinitite is the material that was created from the first test. And using that, you know, so the copper comes from the wires that were used to set it up, and using that very specific ratio, they were able to trace that back to the exact uh, factory where those wires were made, which happened to be in Canada. So it doesn't have to necessarily be even looking at the uranium or the plutonium. There's a whole suite of tools that you could use. It's interesting to talk to the IAEA about this because they've begun building a library, essentially, that you would be able to map this stuff. One last one. Uh, can you talk about the science? When we hear people talk about how there's a US military option to take out someone's nukes, for instance, in North Korea, what would be the science of if we bombed a nuclear facility or a facility where we thought they kept nuclear weapons, what are the dangers or what, what, what does it really mean that you could take out someone's nukes safely? Uh, so, great question. Um, and it depends on the actual infrastructure you're attacking. So, in 1984, when we almost went to war with North Korea, I was in the White House at that time and was definitely <laughs> feeling nervous. Um, I, there was, they had no nuclear weapons. Uh, there was one nuclear facility, we knew where it was. We had a pretty detailed plan and would have released some radiation, but not a huge amount, because we you know, thought about that. Uh, now they have possibly dozens of nuclear weapons. We don't know where they are, that's a big problem. Secondly, we have at least modest confidence that they have a second nuclear facility that does uranium enrichment somewhere that we don't know about. Uh, so, again, you can't hit, but you don't know where it is. Uh, now, a lot of the nuclear weapons uh, are believed to be in tunnels and caves and so on, uh, which makes it trickier to get them. Uh, you can definitely shut the door, you can, you can blow up the entrance of the cave, um, and force them to dig it out. But, um, so then there's the question of uh, to what extent are they booby trapped? Uh, this would be a big issue, for example, if we, heaven forbid, did find that a terrorist had put a nuclear bomb in a city somewhere and you actually managed to find it and you knew where it was. We have a variety of render safe technology to try to, you know, uh, cause such a bomb not to go off. But, you know, what if it's arranged so that if they see anybody getting anywhere near it, they detonate? Um, uh, so it's, it's, 
it's tricky. Um, I, but uh, the bottom line on the North Korea situation right now is we just don't have the military capability because we don't know where all the weapons are. Well, this has been great. Thank you uh, all three um, for a great opening session and uh, taught us all a lot. And uh, we'll all be around here if you guys need to grab anybody in this room. Thanks. Thank you.